Hello, I'm Rose Fatal, and you're watching the first half of a two-part series that covers many of Portugal's severe issues. This video reveals Portugal's recent history, including life under the Estado Novo dictatorship, how the revolution ended it, and the chaos that ensued. In the second video, I'll be revealing how China's hand in Portugal is presently destroying the country. Portugal, a Mediterranean country known for its long summers, beautiful landscapes, and rich history. This makes it a three-time Oscar winner for Best Tourist Destination in the World. As a person who used to live in Portugal for almost a year, I can understand why many wealthy people would choose to buy their second and third home in Portugal. However, Portugal is also mired in many serious problems, including corruption, human trafficking, and astronomical debt. How did it come to this? To get better insight, I've turned to Bruno, a specialist in Portuguese history as well as Portugal's relationship to Angola. So Bruno, what led Portugal to the path it is on today? Well, to, to understand Portugal nowadays, you have to look into its recent past. You gotta understand that from 1933 until 1974, Portugal was controlled by the Estado Novo dictatorship, which ruled the country with an iron fist. Their draconian restrictions on the individuality took a severe toll on ingenuity as well as critical thinking, ultimately preventing Portugal from developing at the same pace as its European neighbors. Meanwhile, Portugal's economy is actually largely dependent on its African colonies. They included Cape Verde, Mozambique, Saint Tomé and Príncipe, and Guinea-Bissau. However, Angola was their primary source of revenue due to its oil, gold and diamonds. These African colonies produced tremendous amounts of wealth, most of which was then sent back to Portugal. Sadly, the dictatorship squandered most of the wealth instead of investing it on modernizing Portugal's infrastructure. The Estado Novo dictatorship was finally overthrown in 1974, which resulted in Portugal losing all their African colonies, as each of them finally regained their independence. Furthermore, following Portugal's African colonies' independence, hundreds of thousands of Portuguese people who had owned any land, businesses and farms in Africa found themselves expelled back to Portugal. So this resulted in an influx of bankrupt Portuguese people flooding the newly formed Portuguese democracy. This led to a massive surge in unemployment as well as crime, as you can imagine. This devastated the Portuguese economy to the point that, for a time, they had the lowest income per capita in Western Europe. Furthermore, it had the highest rate of preventable deaths as well as infant mortality in Europe. Furthermore, most Portuguese people were very uneducated due to the extremely poor quality of most Portuguese schools. Despite our country's small population, millions of Portuguese adults were still illiterate when the dictatorship came to an end. They didn't, didn't know how to read or write. In most regards, Portugal was kind of like half a century behind the rest of the developed world. During this chaotic time, Portugal tried to shift towards a democratic government. However, again, it was very politically unstable due to the, uh, to the power vacuum. This made it easy for the most wealthy and well-connected families to take control of much of the country and all their institutions. For example, once in power, many of these individuals promoted their unqualified friends into high-ranking positions within the Portuguese government. One notably family in particular was the Espírito Santo family, who owned pretty much all the main banks in Portugal, namely Banco Espírito Santo, BESH. So Bruno, what was Portugal like during the early 1990s? Well, the country was only just discovering contemporary music and cinema, cultural as a whole. Racism was a normal occurrence, as you may imagine, mainly directed at African migrants who had come from Portugal's former colonies. Oh, preto, cá no meu país tu tens que andar como gente, isto aqui não é África. O quê? Não achas bem? Volta para a tua terra. Aproveita, leva os brasileiros, os chamuças e os The tax system was broken, which made it easy for almost anyone to loan funds 
start companies as well as launder money. This made Portugal a very attractive destination for many wealthy Europeans to invest their money in order to avoid taxes. Portugal did have a number of legitimate exports at the time, which included cork, automobiles, textile and olive oil. However, unofficially, one of their main exports was actually illegal drugs. Portugal was, for a time, the main drug pipeline between Africa and Europe. The Portuguese authorities knew what was going on but didn't try to actively stop it because it was making so many powerful people incredibly rich. Drugs flooded the Portuguese shores, resulting in a nationwide drug epidemic that lasted almost a decade. In the process, Casal Ventoso was born, an open-air drug market. Portugal had successfully turned much of their own population into junkies, living in slums while their children were born into a life of drug addiction. The main reason the Portuguese government finally started fighting the drug epidemic was because they wanted Portugal to enter the Eurozone. This required Portugal to comply with the EU's guidelines, such as clamping down on its prominent drug scene. One way the Portuguese government did this was to demolish most of their ghettos and forcibly relocate their former residents away from the cities. This created major problems for the thousands of relocated families, most of whom were unemployed and had used the drug trade to support themselves. In other aspects of life, Portugal dramatically improved. Literacy rates skyrocketed as Portuguese people received a better education. With the introduction of international media and later on the internet, Portuguese people now had access to social influences as well as information from around the world. As a result, our culture evolved rapidly and became globalized. Between 1999 and 2002, Portugal replaced their old currency, the escudo, with the euro. Furthermore, the tax system became digitalized, which enabled Portugal to get social economic funds from the EU. However, despite Portugal's many improvements, unemployment remained high while crime rates increased. Officially, the minimum wage remained at 400 euros a month until 2006. However, in reality, a large portion of the population were subject to the old Portuguese tradition of paying far less than the minimum wage in cash through contractless jobs. This led to a mass exodus of people to other EU nations. Overall, though, things were improving in Portugal. That is, until the 2008 financial crash. How did the 2008 financial crash affect Portugal? So, Portugal was already really burdened by their sovereign debt crisis. So, by 2011, Portugal had to ask for a bailout from the Troika, which was made up of the European Commission, the European Central Bank and the FME, International Monetary Fund. This seriously deepened Portugal's national debt problems. The government was forced to implement severe austerity measures, cutting back on public funding, wages, pensions and social security. I saw countless property and business foreclosures. For years, Portugal was littered with abandoned, half-finished construction jobs due to bankruptcies. Portugal's middle class, as usual, were the ones who had to pay for most of this debt. One of the side effects of the financial crisis was that it exposed a lot of corruption at the highest level. For example, Portugal's former Prime Minister, José Sócrates Carvalho Pinto de Sousa, was indicted for corruption, money laundering and fund appropriation. His cousin had created several Swiss bank accounts, allegedly for the pur purpose of hiding millions of euros the Prime Minister received in bribe money. Furthermore, Ricardo Salgado, the former CEO of Portugal's biggest bank, Bege, supposedly bribed the Prime Minister in order to secure the commercial deals with nationalized companies. However, by 2014, Bege, the bank, filed for bankruptcy, which resulted in countless Portuguese people losing all their life savings. José Socrates was arrested in November 2014, where he spent time in jail before being moved to house arrest in September 2015 and was freed by October 2015. 
As of 2020, during the ongoing investigation, he is required to remain in Portugal. The Portuguese government decided to privatize Portugal's vital infrastructure in order to attract foreign capital. Many in Portugal's government were reluctant to sell their country to foreign powers, but still they went ahead with it. In order to free Portugal from its towering debt, Portugal cleared their debt to the IMF and exited the bailout program. However, they still owed 55 billion euros to European creditors. In order to pay off the rest of the debts and create another revenue stream, the government invested heavily into tourism and infrastructure. They turned many empty houses into hostels and hotels. Portugal was promoted all around the world as a sunny, chilled out cultural country with great hospitality. It worked, resulting in a massive influx of international tourists as well as foreign investments. Unfortunately, this had the side effects of rapidly increasing rent prices nationwide. Many landlords stopped renting to locals as there was better money to be made by converting their properties into hotels or Airbnbs. Much of the local Portuguese population was forced out of its city centers as they could no longer afford the cost of living. Slowing down the skyrocketing rent prices as well as the dr dramatic increase in homeless Portuguese wasn't a priority for the Portuguese government. They were far too focused on how much they were profiting from all the grand gentrification in Portugal. This entire situation proved to be very lucrative for Portuguese wealthy elite while detrimental for much of the rest of its population. It wasn't only powerful Portuguese natives who were taking advantage of this opportunity. Portugal became one of Europe's primary destinations for foreign wealthy criminals to launder their money. This was especially appealing for Angola's newly financial elite, in particular the Dushantos family, who controlled Angola. The former colony was going through a 15-year financial boom, primarily thanks to their enormous oil reserves, but also in part because of their conflict diamonds. Luanda is right now the capital of Angola, the most expensive city in the world. In order to attract more investments from Angola, the Portuguese government modified some of their laws in order to make it easier for the corrupt, wealthy elite from Angola to channel their money through Portugal. One of such modification was the creation of the Golden Visa. Initially, it was created so that more wealthy Angolans could migrate to Portugal with ease. That resulted in countless rich Angolans buying up land and businesses across Portugal, primarily in Lisbon. Everything from buildings, companies, football clubs, nightclubs and bars were up for grabs. At the same time, tens of thousands of Portuguese citizens migrated to Angola where they could earn far better salaries than they could back in Portugal. Most of this came to an abrupt end when the price of oil crashed. Angola's economy largely collapsed. Almost all the many thousands of Portuguese people who work here were forced to return to Portugal empty-handed as their Angolan employers denied them months of back pay. Seeking another source of revenue, the Portuguese turned to China, who rapidly became the primary investor in Portugal. China took advantage of the golden visa opportunities that were originally designed for Angolans. Within a few short years, there were more golden visas granted to Chinese citizens than that of the rest of the world combined. During the financial recession, how deep was Portugal's relationship with Angola? And is it still ongoing? Okay, so Isabel dos Santos is Africa's richest woman, the daughter of Angola's former president and dictator, as well as the ex-chairwoman of the state oil company, Son Angol, invested billions of euros into Portugal. She owns stakes in more than 130 Portuguese companies, 79 of which she bought from the 2008 onwards. These companies are related to or in the telecommunications, media, retail, finance and energy industries of Portugal. Additionally, in 2015, Portugal sold a 9.7% stake in Banco BPE, now Portugal's fifth biggest bank by assets, to Isabel dos Santos. Furthermore, she owns her own bank, Banco BIC, BIC, which started in Angola but expanded into Portugal 
gaining a foothold in Europe. However, she ran into a few problems during her rise to power. The financial crisis also highlighted how many international banks failed to do their due diligence and allowed large transfers of illicit funds. Their string of money laundering scandals resulted in more scrutiny on banks by the financial regulators. Thus, in 2012, when a cease and desist order was given to Citibank by US financial regulators, many other banks, including the UK's Barclays Bank, Netherlands Bank, Germany's Deutsche Bank, and Spain's Santander Bank, all cut ties with any potentially problematic clients. And obviously, this included Isabel dos Santos, who was identified as a politically exposed person who could potentially use her ties for bribery money laundering and other forms of corruption. She is well known for owning corporations and shares of companies around the world, ranging for example from Italy, UK, New York, Hong Kong, Malta, Thailand, Abu Dhabi, Dubai and Cyprus, to name just a few. However, Portugal was happy to continue to do business with Isabel dos Santos and other questionable entities. For example, the banks BIC and BPE eagerly helped Isabel and her husband, Doko, launder the money she had embezzled from Sonangol to offshore banks all around the world. As a result, despite the minor inconveniences other banks had placed on Isabel dos Santos, her assets continued to grow. There is only one winner in that story, and that person is Jose Eduardo dos Santos and his daughter Isabel, who has already invested these enormous profits overseas. Most of the big Portuguese firms, from GALP to Unitel, are now under the control of this family. If Portugal was a colonizer in the past, well, they've now become Angola's money launderer. A man called Rui Pinto unveiled 715,000 documents named as the Luanda Leaks, aimed at the public, so they may hold billionaires and financial institutions accountable. Nuno Ribeiro da Cunha was the Portuguese director of Eurobic, a bank that is co-owned by Isabel dos Santos. He also handled a number of transactions for companies controlled directly by Isabel dos Santos. Yet, when Nuno Ribeiro da Cunha was found dead, in his Lisbon home on the 22nd January of 2020, neither Yerubik nor Isabel dos Santos had anything to say. As of making this video, many other Portuguese companies that Isabel dos Santos also owns are currently under investigations by the EU and the Portuguese authorities. With all the corruption plaguing Portugal on so many levels, can its citizens clean up their country and bring it back to prosperity? Or is Portugal doomed to collapse into extreme crime and poverty? To understand what severe difficulties Portugal is currently struggling with, feel free to check out the second half of this series. Link in the description below. If you enjoyed this video or simply found it informative, please remember to like, subscribe and ding the bell in order to get notifications for our upcoming content. It's been Fatally Honest. Ciao!